Hi, all. Thanks for staying so late. It has been a long, long day for all of us. Thanks for the procession. It was really intimate and intimidating at the same time. Thanks for that. Uh, my name is Robin van den Akker. I'm a Dutch cultural philosopher working at Erasmus University. And this is my good friend and colleague, Timotheus van Meulen, working in the University of Nijmegen. Um, for the last couple of years, we have been working on a project on contemporary art and culture called Notes on Metamodernism. And there goes my name tag. Well, you heard it. Uh, Notes on Metamodernism. Um, and of course, that's always dangerous because there's an ism in that term. But we do not try to write manifestos or tell you how you should work as an artist. But what we try to do is make a cultural analysis by looking at all the art practices of young artists like yourself. And what we see then is that those art practices have been changing over the last decade or so, um, and changing beyond recognition. These art practices cannot any longer be described in terms of what the generations before us called postmodernism. All the postmodern definitions and the vernacular do no longer seem sufficient to understand what has been going on today and elsewhere in the arts. Um, as you probably have noticed today, we have been lurking around in the background. We have been roaming all the work uh, workshop uh, spaces today. Um, and we've been trying to observe what has been going on. And um, I have to say that I was really uh, touched by all the enthusiasm that you put into the workshops. That was really, really great. And I would suggest that we all just give a big cheer for yourself because you worked really well today. It was really a joy. And I've never done this before, so please help me. Um, also, I would uh, like the organizers of today, Artes, and then all the things, I get it over and done with, but one last for the organizers, please, and this is so awkward again. Please. Okay, already said it, it has been a very, very long day, and we're not going to ruin this day by talking hours and hours and hours, Fido Castro like length. So we keep it short, and um, Tim will shortly explain what we're going to do. Yes, so a new dawn. Hey, that's the, the theme of the day. And so I think it's, it's important for us all at the end of that day to think about what a new dawn means. What do we mean when we speak about a new dawn? So we mean that something is new, that is to say it's no longer old, it's no longer the thing of yesterday or the day before, it's something that's entirely of this moment. It's something that we've entered now and not a second ago. So something is new, it's no longer old, it's no longer of the past. The idea of a dawn, I think, is even more important. Because what is a dawn? It's the moment that everything turns light, but we do not yet see the sun. So we see something, we see something emerging, and we presume the sun is behind it, it may turn out it's something else, a spaceship. But we presume that the sun is behind it, but we don't see it. We don't know where it will show up. And so dawn is the emergence of something new, but something that we're not yet entirely able to put into words. And I think what was so wonderful about um, the events of the day and the workshops that um, Studium Generale organized is that they gave us an intimation, an idea of what the sun may look like, of what kind of things may be um, emerging beyond the horizon. And for us, what we noticed today were that five teams, or sort of five tropes or ideas, were more dominant than others. And so we'd like, with you, to go through those five teams. And I think they're themes that are incredibly different from the themes of the 90s. And so most of you have grown up in the 90s and then were teenagers, perhaps, in the 2000s. And you, you may also notice the enormous difference with those 90s. This was when I grew up. And for me, it's a, it's a shift, it's a paradigm shift. And those themes are storytelling, the return of a big story. We've got something to tell, and we'd like to tell it. The idea of political engagement. I think uh, what we've seen today is that there is a need and an urgency to be political, to be socially engaged, to do something to someone. The idea of a new sincerity. Gone is all that sarcasm and cynicism uh, we want to be sincere. We know that we may not succeed, but we all really would like to be sincere. There is the idea of craftsmanship, eh, working with your hands, doing something, being able to actually produce 
drawing, sculpting, um, using uh, the internet, whatever, but making something. And finally, the idea of effect, of empathy, of caring for others around you. And so, to go through it with the idea of storytelling, this is by Charles Avery, this is an old work, 2007, I was informed early, early on the day. Um, and this is really symptomatic for the return to a great story. In the 90s, as you may remember, everyone said, look, whatever happens, let's not tell big stories. And so we get novels by uh, Brett Easton Ellis of American Psycho, you may recall him, and artists like Damien Hirst. And these artists and writers say, um, all those big stories, those big dreams, those big ideologies, they all led to disaster. Communism, Nazism, capitalism. It was just shit. So what we should do instead is to deconstruct those stories. We'll take them apart. Yeah? So we, we move from story to story, we fragment them, and we show what they're actually about, and how unequal they are, and how unfair, and how unreal. Yeah, it's very important. And then suddenly in the 2000s, led by Charles Avery, among others, we see this return to the big story, to a big story. And it's not a naive art. It's not an art that says, I'm telling a, a big story, I'm creating a new ideology, um, and it will be the best. It's not that. It's a grand narrative that shows that it knows of the problems of past stories. And so here, in this work by Charles Avery, who creates the islanders, a new country which does and does not entirely belong into our world, but seems to have everything of our world in it, we see all kinds of forms and shapes and figures that we know. And we know the triangles. We somehow seem to recognize elements of these, these, these creatures, these alephs. Yeah, maybe a bird, or some kind of lion, or whatever. We see forms in them. But we do not recognize them in the way in which they're structured. And so, what is happening here, and I think what we've seen happening today, is that people are working with things that we've known before, but they're reconfiguring them. They're turning them into something else. And so there's, that seems to be an important part of this new story. Another great example today has been the workshop by the Rotterdam Theatre Group, Wunderbaum. And what they have been trying to do, not only in the workshop, but already for some time now and for another few years to come, is rethinking what it means to change society, reconstruct another society, and what it takes to actually do so. And it was fun today, I, as I said, I was lurking in the background of all those workshops, and I entered the room precisely on the moment that everybody started to fight and wrestle. There were 24, 25 people on stage, and they were all fighting. And what it shows is that, indeed, this is not a naive attempt to form or rephrase a utopian longing. We know that such a thing can be dangerous, has been dangerous in the past, but we have to do so nonetheless. And it might be a failure and we might get hurt, but we have to try in spite of all those dangers. And this is also of course, what we see eh, with uh, the procession that just came in. So we have all these students who have been sitting together today um, under the leadership of, if I can call it leadership, of Uwe Minde, the uh, famous Berlin-based artist. And they've tried to come up with a demand. Students, 20 to 25 to 30 years old, um, perhaps born in some kind of wealth, and they want to make a demand. They want to say, look, the world is you know, it's going to shit as we speak. And, and that is, I think we all see that you know, it's not going very well. And so they want to make a demand. Um, but they're not entirely sure what that demand should be. At least, I think I interpreted it correctly, because the, uh, the, the placards were empty. There wasn't one specific demand. It could be any single thing. It could be all kinds of demands, but we're not yet sure what it is that we precisely would like to do. And so there is a social engagement, but it's an unsure social engagement. It's constructive, it's not breaking down, it is building something new, but it is also unsure. Um, at the same time, as we as young people need to rephrase our demands, need to rethink our present, um, in order to get to another future, we also see all kinds of other things emerging. They are emerging from older forms and older structures. One, one good example is, for example, uh, the workshop today by Time Bank. What they are trying to do is 
create an alternative economy, an economy that can fill the holes that um, are being created by uh, the negligence of, of the past 30 years. Whole, an economy that revolves around services that you do not do because you want to make a profit, but because you want to help somebody else. And that uh, services that take money out of the equation and uh, revert to time-based currencies. And of course, we've also seen a lot of workshops today that turn out to alter alternative systems of circulation, but alternative systems of design, product design. Um, the sustainism workshop was a great example of that, of course. And also the food workshop uh, today, no time to waste, it was not a great example. And when I entered there, I picked something up, and of course it sounds very corny, but at the same time, not at all. And uh, the workshop leader said something like, you are what you eat. And of course, that's true. But if that's true, then when you change what you eat, you also change who you are. And I think that is one of the inspiring lessons of that workshop today. Um, another workshop today that to do with design was the workshop by Next Nature. Um, and what I find particularly interesting, not in the practice of Next Nature, but in the presentation, in the whole sensibility that surrounds it. Of course, in the 90s, when you said, I want to change the world because the world is shit and I want to uh, make it a better place, people laughed at you. You made yourself ridiculous. They ironized your attempt. They winked and they just went on with their lives. And you see this kind of ironic, wink, smirky thing still in some of the, in, in, in the layout of the, that beautiful book of Next Nature. It is still a wink. It's still a kind of joke, but at the same time, that joke is turned towards something that is um, a, a real engagement, a sincere engagement, an idealism. And this is something that um, has become really prevalent of late, is that we have to somehow overcome this irony, not by cutting it loose, but by suspending it temporarily and incorporating it within our rhetorics. And Rob Fuhrman's work, who you may have seen in the hallway here, where students have been building together from cardboard, from pieces of paper, from plastic, an entire new world, an entire sort of new fortress or city um, of the future, and we also see it in this work, there is the same sort of attitude. In the 90s, people intertextually use all kinds of stuff. Eh? We call it pastiche or eclecticism or cut and paste or whatever. They use stuff from everywhere and from nowhere. And they do that in order to ridicule or to make fun of those previous practices and say, ha-ha, what an idiot eh, those our forefathers were. And, and maybe they were. But what we see now in the work of Rob Woman is that he uses all kinds of discarded objects, all kinds of materials that are already available, materials that were unsuccessful in the past or that may have failed, and also strategies and references of the past, the hippies with the do-it-yourself culture. There is a sense of the apocalypse here. There is a sense um, of woodworking. Um, of new ageism, of sci-fi, all those previous weird elements, they're not used in order to ridicule them. We see them, we know that they exist, we know that they're part of this project, but they're used in order to build a new future, a future that's doomed, a future that cannot exist in the form that is proposed, but a future nonetheless, the idea of going forward. And that is incredibly sincere. And a similar sort of sincerity, of course, is noticeable in the idea of crafts. I think especially for the art students, um, the textbooks you'll read, they'll always end with conceptualism. The 90s are a period of conceptualism. People like to think in terms of ideas, and the craft is no longer really of importance. And then suddenly, in the early 2000s, you see craft everywhere, whether it's knitting, or making a blog, or making a cake, or whatever. The idea of craft, of being able to make something with your own hands, has returned and is very important. And today we've seen it, I think, throughout all the different workshops, whether it is in the workshop of Nathan Johnson, who uses all kinds of art materials in order to create soundtracks, or in the golden joinery. It's about creating from things that you had, with your own hands, something new. Yes. Um of course, I was not able to include the workshop today by Todd Macover, but I found this really inspiring project by him. Um, and you can describe this as some kind of collaborative symphony um, organized by and for a whole city, by all the people of Toronto. What is so interesting about this is that it shows 
that you can move people, that you can bring them to work towards the same goal, not by winning the argument by means of rational argumentation. You can also do that by making them feel that it's necessary to work, to work this, towards the same goal, or making them feel that it's fun to do so. And that is something that we have been that has been going on um, in, in, in the workshops that I, saw today, that I saw today as well. In Rob Voermans workshop, the energy was everywhere. People were cutting, pasting, drilling, uh, building, and, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun, basically. So the lesson here is that something that the right is really good at, namely affecting the public debate, uh, playing into your underbelly, making you feel a certain way in order to push you into a certain way, maybe progressive people have to learn that trick a bit better. And so we don't know really what the new dawn is all about. I think we've all seen certain themes pop up. There is the return of the story, of the grand narrative. There is the return of empathy and of caring. There is this sense of wanting to make things with your hands and wanting to do that right. There is a sense of needing to, uh, to engage politically, socially, effectively with the world around you. There is all that. There is a sense that you say, I cannot just be cyn uh, um, cynical. You know, I'm, I'm so tired of being ironic all the time. I want to be sincere. You're not. We're all, I think, from the start, ironic. That's how we were raised. We were raised on The Simpsons and South Park, which is magnificent. But we want also to be sincere. So all those things, they seem to pop up. And they are in relation to a much wider situation. A situation of Occupy, but also of the Tea Party Patriots. Yeah, where suddenly that centralized politics of the 90s, of Blair and of Wim Kok and of Schroeder and of Clinton, where left and right are become redundant categories, where there is no longer any ideology, people call it the end of history or whatever kind of nonsense, that situation of peace and of wealth, where all the jobs were available, where the future you know, was um, littered in gold most of the times and diamonds and whatever, that is gone. We have a situation where the center of politics is completely disintegrated. We've got left again and right, and we've got the very rich and the very poor, and all those things change the way in which we need to engage. And so Occupy does that. They say, I'm a hypocrite, but I, I really do want to try and change this world. The Tea Party does it. Um, we see it in the films with Wes Anderson. We see it in the literature of David Foster Wallace, in the music of Anthony and the Johnsons and Devendra Bennard and Coco Rosie and the Freak Folk. Everywhere, suddenly, we see something emerging that is very similar to the things that we've discussed today. No longer the, the cynicism of grunge, no longer the cynicism of postmodern literature, no longer the cynicism of postmodern cinema. That seems to be something of the past. Something new has arisen. Okay, you may have noticed our... Uh silly attempt to structure this talk uh, by means of the Nina Simona song that's in your uh, <laughs> program book. New dawn, new day, new life, of course. Next, that just as an aside. Um, all these things have been emerging within a certain um, situation. A situation that has been emerging since the 2000s, you could say. There are actually three key developments that play into all these changes in, in, our, in our attitudes, in the way we look at the world, the way we practice in the world, the way we do things, the way we approach the way of making art. Um, and the first one is that there are, of course, several crises. Our culture today is crisis-ridden. Um, in the 90s, in the 80s, it might have looked like the West was the one and only dominant pole in the geopolitical spectrum, but what we have been seeing over the last decades is that there actually are a lot of superpowers emerging. The BRICS, the so-called BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, they have been contesting Western hegemony. And that sounds really like something that is really far from your bed, but of course it's not. Of course, it is affecting your daily life directly. Um, and then there has, have been all the financial crises. It all started out with the banking crisis in 2008, but what we are noticing now, actually, after all the rounds of austerity measures, we now notice what it actually means to live in a neoliberal society. We're actually going to a much purer form of capitalism. Now we're finally feeling what it is. As young people, for example, where you come out of school, it's very hard to get a fixed job. Then it's even harder to find uh, a mortgage for your house. Um, 
so actually trying to we, we, we get a sense of what it is to live in a very, very capitalist society. And of course, related to that, we see all, all these kinds of ecological crises. The capitalist system is a system that is plundering planet Earth, and we're becoming more and more aware of that. And that's something as well that we see in, um, in our daily lives, and that we should see in our daily lives when it comes to the products that we buy, design, etc. Um, the second great development has been, of course, the emergence of the Internet. And that the Internet has, has been emerging since the 60s, 70s, arguably the 80s. But what is important here is that since the 2000s, each and every one of us has a personal computer. Before that, it was at work or it was a government office, but not in your home. And now with smartphones, tablets, etc. That is a really bad development on the one hand. On the other hand, it also allows us to organize, coordinate our daily lives, to start sharing things, to uh, bind our communities tighter together. And then there is a new generation that is growing up in this world, this world after the crisis, the coming of age in a world where um, there's a lot of insecurity and they face a future that is even more insecure because of all the ecological crisis. And they're coming into its own in a world that is increasingly inter connected. And of course, Douglas Copeland wrote the book Generation X about that cynical, lethargic uh, generation that is maybe even my own generation, I don't know, probably. But a couple of years ago, he wrote the book Generation A, about the generation that has to start all over again, has to reinvent the wheel, has to uh, restructure their daily lives. And so what we see is both a necessity to act, the crises, they necessitate you really to change. There is an ability to change because of the internet and its, its many uh, advances, and there is a desire located in a new generation. And we call this, and I think that's how we should also end, we call this metamodernism. So, you know, forget postmodernism, that's over. It is really something of the past. So the theorist Linda Hutchin, um, who wrote a book on postmodernism, ended it by saying, look, I've just written this book, but it's gone. That period is something of the past, and now we live in a new emerging world, the world of metamodernism. Thank you very much.